Well, good morning. Good to see you all here today. And if there are any of your visitors, you're especially welcome as we gather to worship the Lord today. A few announcements before we turn to worship. Uh, firstly, thanks to everyone who supported uh, last Sunday night's Presbyterian Youth Rally here in the church. We had over 90 young people in attendance with some of our own young, own young people uh, taking part, performing in the praise band. Uh, and everyone was treated to refreshments in the hall afterwards. So a big thank you to everyone who helped to make this a special night for our young people. A word of thanks to everyone who attended the first Drummer Coast BB display on Friday evening. The boys of all sections, their officers and helpers, are to commend, be commended for all the time and effort they put in to making it a great night. And the evening ended uh, on a high note with eight boys receiving their president's badge, and they are to be congratulated on this significant achievement. A Presbyterian Mission Rally will be held in Dungiven Presbyterian Church tonight at 7 p.m. and will feature speakers Naomi Laramore and Phoebe Nugent. The offering will be in support of mission at home and overseas. And just to say, if you're making your way over to Dungiven this evening, uh, car parking will be available in the grounds of the station. And then an appeal for volunteers. Roe Valley SISM is planned for the 6th to the 13th of August. A team of 21 will be required, but so far there have only been eight applications. Applicants must be Christian, 17 years or older, and a regular church attender. To register, visit suni.co.uk, that's S-U-N-I, and follow the link. The deadline for registration is less than a fortnight away, which is Friday the 31st of March. And then I have a notice, this is regarding a leaflet that I've placed in the vestibule this morning uh, from the Christian Institute. Uh, entitled Defending Faith, Family and Freedom. This is a series of meetings happening across Northern Ireland over the coming days. And the closest one to us uh, will be in Korean. That's Tuesday the 28th of March from 8 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. in the Lodge Hotel. The Institute is holding this, these meetings across Northern Ireland to address a number of issues challenging Christians in the province and throughout the UK. Uh, topics to be discussed include gender ideology, conversion therapy, and assisted suicide. So if you're interested in finding out more and how you can be involved in making a difference, uh, please put that date in your diary. Tuesday the 28th of March in the Lodge Hotel in Korean from 8 to 9.30. And there are a few leaflets in the vestibule if you're interested in following that up. Anyone requiring prayer support is encouraged to put details of any requests in the box in the vestibule, and a member of our prayer team will follow that up. And then finally, just to say that, uh, well, just to ask uh, if members of the committee would wait behind for a few moments at the close of the service, maybe make your way into the minister's room. Uh, I've just one item of business uh, to put to you. That is all by way of announcement. As we come to worship the Lord today, let us reflect on these words of the psalmist as found in Psalm 119. Blessed are they whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are they who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do nothing wrong, they walk in his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. This is the God who has given us his word to guide us through our lives. And this is the God that we're going to worship now as we stand to sing our opening praise, Be Thou My Vision, which is hymn 491.
Well, boys and girls, I can see you down there, but I'd like you to come up to the front and we'll have a wee chat together, so come on on up. Oh yes, loads of room, get you all squeezed in there at the front, brilliant. Well. Great to see you all today. We're going to begin with a short Bible reading. So hopefully, here's the first slide. Thanks, Darren. So this is a reading that's found in Romans, which is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote a long, long time ago. And these are just a few verses from Romans chapter 12. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, Speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. So today we're thinking about gifts and how we use them. Now we're not talking about the gifts that we get um, at Christmas or at Easter or on our birthday or even the gifts that mummies maybe have got today. We're thinking about the gifts, the abilities that God has given us to do certain things. Now you may have heard someone say uh, to somebody else who's done something silly, oh you silly goose you. Have you ever heard that? Maybe that's not your generation. It's probably my generation where, uh, and it was particularly my granny would have said to me, oh, you silly goose, you. And, you know, that makes it sound as if geese are silly, but in fact, geese are not silly at all. They are very intelligent. And there's a lot we can learn from geese. And hopefully you'll see a picture on the screen here and you can see a flock of geese flying together. But is there something unusual about the way they're flying. Do you notice anything about it? Yes. Say again. They're in a triangle, yes. They're in a triangle, but I suppose that this bit at the end sort of missing, so it's almost a triangle, but not quite. Yes. It's in an arrow. Yes. They're flying in a V-shape, and that's not an accident. Anytime you see a geese flying through the sky, they're always in this shape, and there's a reason for that. And thankfully now, there are some people who have done research, some scientists have researched into why they fly like that. And it's basically this. Whenever a goose is flying behind another one, it gets the benefit of the uplift of the, the goose in front of them. Whenever they flap their wings, it helps the one behind. So it does. So the one at the front is doing most of the hard work, and the ones that fly in behind, they are actually helped so much so that if they were to fly on their own, they could maybe fly 60 miles, and then they'd be tired. But if they fly behind another goose, they can fly 100 miles. So flying behind the, one of the other geese means that they are helped. Do you think the one at the front stays at the front? No. What do you think happens? Because the one at the front's going to get tired, isn't it? So what do you think they would do? Yeah. They swap over. They all take turns to fly at the front to help the others. So the one at the front goes behind and then they have time to recover. Isn't that fantastic? Now sometimes a goose will get sick and sometimes they have to go down to ground. And you know what happens then? Is that one left alone? No. The other geese go down and stay with it until it's well again. So what lessons do you think we learn from the geese? Because we're, we can't fly. That's not our gift. Sure, it's not. But we can learn valuable lessons from the, from the geese. So here, here are a few of the lessons. The first thing is that all of us can take it in turns to help others. Sometimes you may have seen somebody doing something and say, say to yourself, well, they're really struggling there, aren't they? Maybe I could help. Just as the geese help each other, so we could help others. And here, some folks are gathering up some rubbish from the park, and this young boy and girl are helping out. And that's the sort of thing that we could do. Now, another thing that the geese do is whenever they're flying along, you'll hear them honking. 
You'll hear a honking sound. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to honk, but what we can do, we can shout words of encouragement to those around us. It might be somebody in school who's really struggling with, with the work that they're doing, or somebody you know who's struggling with their homework, and we can say to them, look, you can do this, and maybe we can help them in some way. So we want to be encouragers to those around us. And as I was saying earlier, whenever a goose gets sick, it goes to ground, and the others come down and stay with it. So we have a job to do as well. Whenever there's somebody sick or unwell or who needs help, we can be there for them. So there's lots of lessons that we can learn from the geese. Taking it in turns to help others. Uh, important to hunk our encouragement, to say words that will encourage others. And it's important for us to take time to be with those who need our help. So whenever you see the geese flying information, I hope you remember these important lessons. We can learn so much from these geese who are not silly at all. And as the Bible tells us, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So I hope you will discover your gifts and you'll learn to use them to help and encourage others. Thank you for listening. We're going to bow our heads and talk to God in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the gifts and abilities you have blessed us with. Help us to learn from the geese so that we may use our gifts to serve you and help others. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay, before the boys and girls go out to Children's Church, um, we're going to sing our next praise. Hear the call of the kingdom.
Your offering will now be received. Let us pray. Father, we bless you for the many ways that you have blessed us and watched over us and guided us and provided for us. And as an expression of our gratitude for all your goodness to you, or all your goodness to us, we present these offerings now, praying that you will take them and use them for the extension of your kingdom and the glory of your name. Amen. Our scripture reading today is found in Luke's Gospel, and we're reading from uh, chapter 10 and verse 1. Luke 10, commencing at verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages." Do, do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet, we wipe off against you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had, be, had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would, re, they would have repented long ago, <clears throat> sitting in sackcloth and ashes. ashes. <clears throat> but it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And for you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the skies? No, you will go down to the depths. He who listens to you listens to me. He who rejects you rejects me. But he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the Spirit submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Ending at verse 20, we trust God will bless this reading of his word to our hearts today. Let us join together again in prayer. Let us pray. Loving Father, we thank you for the gift of prayer. Being able to bring our praise and our supplications to you at any time. And just now, we are very mindful of those in need within our community and beyond. So as we come before you now, we bring, we bring those who are unwell, those who are sick, those who are suffering debilitating conditions. We think of those in hospital, receiving treatment, recovering from a procedure. Lord, be close to them and grant them healing. We also think of those who are waiting for a bed, 
We know that in our hospitals now, there are many folks who are stuck in an A&E ward and are anxious. We pray for them as they wait. And we understand, Lord, that our health service is doing the very best it can. Our doctors and our nurses working so hard every day to help as many as possible. But Lord, we know it's a system that's flawed. And so we do want to pray for those who are in positions of responsibility, that you would give them wisdom in regards to the decisions that need to be made to help improve the system. We pray, Lord, for anxious relatives, those worried about those in hospital, those worried about those who are waiting for treatment. And we thank you, Lord, for every member of staff within our hospitals and clinics and all they do, that you would give them the strength and grace that they need in these challenging times. In our prayers, we also remember those being looked after in a care home. We thank you for these facilities, for the staff, for all that they do to help those who, who need their attention almost 24 hours of every day. Again, we ask for your blessing to be upon the staff, that you would strengthen them and give, the, give them the grace they need in the important job that they do. In our prayers today, we also remember those who have known bereavement over recent times. Father, draw close to them, comfort them, enable them to cope with their loss. And thank you, Lord, that when we turn to your word, we are reminded of the hope we have in Christ. And we pray that your word will bring comfort to those who continue to mourn at this time. Thinking of others who are suffering in other parts of the world, we bring before you those affected by the cyclone in Malawi earlier this week. Father, comfort those who have lost loved ones. Give success to aid agencies as they work to bring relief to all affected. And we pray that everyone in need will get the help that they so desperately need at this time. On this Mother's Day, we want to praise you for the gift of family. And especially we thank you for our mothers, for all that they have done in the past, for all that they do now. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us with mothers that care and love and show that love in so many ways. And we want to thank you for the mothers who are no longer with us. Father, thank you for the memory we have of them. And we pray that those memories will bring comfort today. We pray for ourselves as members of your family, the church here on earth. And we thank you, Lord, that you have adopted us into your family because you love us so much and you want the best for us. And so as you have loved us, enable us to love each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And may the community in which you have placed us know that we love each other and that we love you and that they may be drawn to this family. As we take time now to meditate on your word, may we be nourished and refreshed in our walk with you. And we pray that through all that we do today in this service, including our attention to your word, all of it will give glory to Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. We stand again to sing this time hymn number 485, All I Once Held Dear.
Well, they did it. The men in green pulled it off. The players would have been all too aware of the significance of the final game of the tournament. But after a closely contested first half, the Irish eventually showed their quality and accomplished what it had been striving for. A fourth Grand Slam in rugby Six Nation tournament. But I guess you already knew that. Earlier in the week, when Andy Farrell was preparing to name the side to face England in yesterday's crucial game, every one of the Ireland squad would have wanted to be on the team sheet. But there could only be 15 players to take to the field against England at the Aviva Stadium in Dublin. Those 15 and the substitutes on the bench would have recognised the opportunity they'd been given and they would have realized that it was a privilege to be chosen for such an important task. As we've worked our way through Luke's gospel over recent months, we've been reminded that Jesus Christ was chosen for an important task. He was sent on a mission to this world. In the words of the prophet Isaiah, to preach the good news to the poor, proclaim freedom to the imprisoned, bring sight to the, fl- to the blind, and to release the oppressed. Jesus was sent with the purpose of bringing hope to people in distress by making true freedom and a restored relationship with God a possibility. As we read through the early chapters of Luke's gospel, we see Jesus teaching in the synagogues, driving away evil spirits, healing the sick, preaching to the crowds, calling people to follow him as disciples, raising the dead and calming a storm. But in the midst of this busy schedule, Jesus takes time to select certain individuals from among his disciples to be apostles. In chapter 6, we're told how that happens. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. Simon, who he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. From a squad of players, Andy Farrell selected those he thought would be the best to achieve success on a rugby pitch. And from among a group or squad of disciples, Jesus chose 12 to be on his special team. They would be known as the Twelve, but they were also designated apostles. The word apostle occurs in the New Testament 80 times. We find it mostly in Luke's Gospel and in the writings of Paul. And it's derived from the Greek verb apostello, which means to send. And so we should think of an apostle as one who's been sent. Just as Jesus had been chosen by his heavenly Father and sent here on a mission. So he in turn chose and sent out the twelve. In Luke chapter 9, we're told that he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And here in chapter 10, we're told that Jesus appoints 72 others and sends them out in pairs to the towns and places he'll be visiting. When a person responds to the call of God, upon their life, and puts their trust in his son for salvation, they become a new person. In the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And so when someone becomes a Christian, they become a new creation. They've begun a new life. They've been reborn. This is the second birth that Jesus spoke of to the Pharisee Nicodemus when he said, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. When someone takes this step of faith and commits their life to Christ, there can be some uncertainty as to what it will mean for them in terms of the adjustments they may have to make and how they'll live this new life. And for some people, this can be quite a challenge. So when a person comes to saving faith, how are they meant to live their life? Well, when someone puts their trust in Christ for salvation, they experience rebirth. But with this new life comes new responsibilities. And as we read through the events portrayed here in Luke chapter 10, we discover three things that God wants us to be. 
an ambassador, a good neighbor, and a worshiper. The 72 men who were sent by Jesus were not called apostles, but they were still sent with a commission to represent the Lord. The scriptures declare that Jesus Christ is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And so these men who went out into the towns and villages of Judea were, in effect, ambassadors of the king. Not only were they sent by him, but they were sent before him to prepare the way for his coming. This was certainly a dignified calling, but it was also a difficult calling. Any of you who have experience of crop farming will know that harvesting is hard work, even when there are a lot of people to help you. But these men were sent into a vast spiritual harvest field with very few workers to help them. But note that instead of praying for an easier job, they were to pray for more workers to join them in the task. Jesus told them in verse 2, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And that is a prayer that we need to be praying. But notice also that they were to pray for workers, not spectators. Sadly, too often folk in churches pray for someone else to come and do the job that they are unwilling to do themselves. The task the 72 were called to was a dangerous one. They were engaging with a deadly enemy, illustrated by their report back to Jesus in verse 17. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. They were sent to invade enemy territory, and they would be like lambs among wolves. But as long as they relied on the Lord, they would be sure of his protection and victory in this spiritual battle. It was the American preacher and author, Vance Havner, who said, any man who takes Jesus Christ seriously becomes the target of the devil. But the problem is that most church members do not give Satan enough trouble to arouse opposition. It would require discipline and faith for the 72 to do the job that Jesus had given them. They would have to trust God to provide homes and food for them, and they were not to be embarrassed to accept hospitality. Jesus told them, verse 5, when you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. They were ambassadors of peace, bringing healing to the sick, deliverance to those who were possessed by evil spirits, and they were to share the good news of salvation with lost sinners. Like Joshua's army of old, they, were, they first, proclaimed peace to, who first proclaimed peace to the cities. If a city rejected the offer of peace, then it faced judgment, reminding us that it's a serious thing to reject God's ambassador or representative. It's important to note that the special powers that the Lord gave to his apostles and the 72 are not ours to claim today. These men were engaged in a very special ministry at a particular time when God's power was being displayed through his son. And although God does sometimes move in miraculous ways to bring healing today, he didn't promise to duplicate these powers in our day and age. Our Lord's instruction to us through his word emphasizes the proclamation of the message, not the performing of miracles. And so if we're committed to living for Christ, the first thing we are to be is an ambassador. The Lord expects us to represent him in the world. Look then, highlights an occasion when Jesus told a story in response to a question from a Bible scholar, and I'm reading from verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. 
A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I, re I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. It's a well-known story. But like all the stories that we have become familiar with, there is a danger that we miss the point of its telling. Jesus told it in response to a question from a scholar, but it was a trick question. Having answered the man's initial question regarding eternal life, Jesus is faced with an additional question. Who is my neighbor? And in asking this follow-up question, the man was really just trying to wriggle out of the responsibility to do what the law required. That is, to love God and your neighbor. To really understand the radical nature of this story, we need to set it in its context. The Jews and the Samaritans were bitter enemies. And so when it turns out that one, the one who helped the man who was left for dead was a Samaritan rather than a fellow Jew, the audience would have been stunned. To get an idea of the effect, just try substituting Protestant for the man who was beaten and robbed and insert Roman Catholic for the man who stopped and helped him. And you'll get the picture. Those who have trusted in Christ are called to be good neighbors. God expects us to look out for others and do what we can to help them. Just as in Christ, God has shown us mercy, we are to show mercy to others. We are called to be Christ's ambassadors in this world, and we are called to be good neighbors. And in so doing, we will imitate the Lord. Luke then tells of another encounter that Jesus has with two women. And I'm reading from verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. It's okay to be busy sometimes. But as someone has rightly said, it's possible to get so caught up in the work of the Lord that we forget the Lord of the work. There's no doubt that Martha meant well, and I'm sure Jesus was not criticizing her eagerness to prepare food or do the housework. These are important duties. But it's so easy to get caught up in the busyness of life to the extent that the Lord gets left out. In his response to Martha, Jesus made it clear that we all need to take time to connect with him in worship. Worship should be at the heart of all we do as a Christian. Yes, it's important that we're busy ambassadors sharing the gospel through our words and actions with our neighbors, friends, and work colleagues. It's essential that we are good neighbors to those in our world who are in need. But before we can represent Christ as we should or imitate him through a caring ministry to others, we must spend time with him and learn from him. The scriptures make it clear what God expects of us. God says, be holy as I am holy. And so we must take time to be holy. We do this not just through corporate gatherings such as this one, but through times of prayer with the Lord and through personal Bible study. The opportunities for both are there. We just need to make them a priority and get on with it. 
If we make our relationship with the Lord a priority, he will bless us and equip us for the work he's called us to. So like Mary, let's make it our goal to be worshipers. A worshiper takes time to listen to the Lord and takes time to be holy. Yesterday, the Ireland rugby team completed its mission to win this year's Six Nations trophy and achieve an historic fourth Grand Slam, its first in Dublin. Their success will be celebrated throughout this island and wherever people claim an Irish connection. There will likely be a civic reception for the victorious team and there's no doubt that they will receive the plaudits of many. But what about us? When we have completed our mission here on earth and we make our way to heaven, what kind of reception awaits us? Well, the events recorded by Luke in chapter 10 of his gospel assure us that those who strive to be God's ambassadors, those who are good neighbors, and those who seek to worship the living God will receive a welcome that no doubt will include these words, well done, good and faithful servant. And really, there could be no greater accolade. Now, that's something really worth striving for. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word to us today. Reminding us, Lord, that you not only call us into your kingdom as followers to become part of your family, but you have given us specific roles in this life. And from your word today, you've reminded us that you want us to represent you. You want us to be your ambassadors in this world. And Lord, that responsibility starts within our own homes, in our communities, within our places of work or study. So enable us, Lord, to represent you well. Your word has reminded us today that we are to be good neighbors. And that's obviously not just to those next door, but wherever we see a need, Lord, we would be there doing what we can to help those who are in need, whether that be practical or spiritual, whatever the need may be. And Lord, most of all, you want us to worship you. And that's not just during this hour on a Sunday morning, but every day of every week to put you first in our lives and seek to honor you in all we do. So enable us by your spirit to put your word into practice in the week that lies ahead, that we might represent you well, we would show kindness, and that we would be worshipers of the living God every day. And others may see that and be drawn to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We stand to sing our closing praise by faith.
mountain shall be moved, and the power of the gospel shall Just a reminder, members of the committee, to wait behind just for a few moments after the benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you, now and forevermore. Amen.